I'm joined by a lot of very lovely people, and they're all going to talk about power management architecture in Ubuntu. Um, for those of you just joining in, uh, if you're on Ubuntu on air.com, please make sure that you use the uh, chat widget below the video. Just choose your random nickname, your favorite nickname, and uh, and hit the connect button. That way you can answer, uh, can ask questions, and it's going to make the whole thing a lot more interesting. When you ask questions, I'm going to repeat this on ISC in a bit, please prefix them with question in capital letters so they stand, send out and we can pick them up more easily. Um, I think with further, without further ado, we should start with a quick round of introduction because we have many, many people in here. Uh, maybe we should go from left to right. Alex? Sure. Uh, my name is Alex Chang. I am uh, an engineering manager in Canonical's commercial engineering group, and uh, my group will be taking the fine work from, from this team and uh, bringing it to market when we go to uh, build a commercial product. And I live in San Francisco. My name is Loic Minier. I'm technical architect for Ubuntu, and I'm looking after defining uh, the right semantics for power management architecture with people in this hangout. Martin. So, hello everyone. I'm Martin Pelt. I'm currently working in Ubuntu's uh, QA team, and I've got quite a bit of history in the area of power management of the early days, like new power and PM utils and so on. Hi, I'm Matt Fisher. Uh, I work for Alex Chang. Uh, I'm going to be a product, part of the product delivery team to try to get this stuff to market. Right. My name is Ricardo Salveri. I'm a developer as well for the mostly focus on Ubuntu Touch project and uh, trying to, to uh, parts of it as well and, 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 and identify like possible issues that might be related with the Android and also thinking about the convergence point of view. Hi, I'm Seth Forshi and I'm an engineer on Canonical's kernel team. Hey, my name is Thomas Foss. Um, I'm a technical architect uh, for Ubuntu as well, much like Greek. Hi, my name is Tony Espy. I'm an engineer on the Touch team um, with a focus on networking and telephony. Perfect. Um, Luik, you set up this, this hangout or uh, reminded everyone to, to be there. Do you have, so, yeah. do you have so, an agenda or should we, should we start with the, with the first question? We got already. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I've set up an agenda and I've pasted it in the um, in the Etherpad. Um, if there's an easy question, like I, I've seen this early question, which was about what are you trying to achieve? So um, that might be can... might be a good start. <laughs> that might be a good start. So um, we've had various conversations between the people in this hangout uh, around the, the how to basically do proper power management in the Ubuntu Touch images, um, which uh, is probably going to be eventually what's being used in all of the Ubuntu products, like Ubuntu Desktop and Ubuntu for tablets and for phones. And uh, there are many related questions. And um, one of the sitting documents, which inspired uh, a lot of this conversation, was created by um, Alex and Matt Fisher in this Hangout. Uh, and it's about it's an analysis of the various ways to do power management in iOS and in Android. Um, and in BlackBerry OS and in other basically mobile operating systems. And that, that kind of, uh, I think, inspired um, a lot of the, uh, uh, it, it, it raised a lot of questions for how we should be doing proper power management for shipping Ubuntu on a phone uh, and, of course, in, in other products. So some of these questions I'd like, to, I'd like to tackle in this Hangout, and if we could reach conclusion, that'd be nice. I'm not sure whether we'll be able to cover some of them. We've had various conversations between people here already. Um, some of them were around like very low level details, some of them about higher level questions such as APIs. Um, one other person I really like to highlight is Seth who's been doing um, some research on the account side of things. So he's created a wiki page which is also linked from the, um, from the Etherpad which is about uh, mobile device power management and it's on the Ubuntu wiki and it explains uh, how some of the subsystems do um, uh, power management. 
So um, one of the things that uh, Seth was about to research was uh, how the touch images are currently doing in terms of power management, which interfaces are currently being in use or not. So I don't know whether, Seth, you've, um, you've had a chance to do this research or was there anything that you could present already about how we're doing there? Or, or I don't have anything today. Um, I've started trying to look into it. There were some problems. I was trying to use things like K-probes and F-trace to get into the kernel, and we had some problems in our images that I had to fix first, so I haven't actually been able to get that data yet. Okay, I also tried to poke a bit at it, like trying to, I tried various mechanisms to try to trace um, how the radio kill switch was being used from Network Manager, and I failed like badly because um, it depends a lot on which driver you're using, uh, the various implementations in Network Manager, and I tried to use iNotify to trace the writes, the files, and that vaguely works, but not in all cases, and had various results with hardware kill switch and software kill switch. It was a bit messy. So I also didn't like complete any kind of coverage of how, what we have today. Louis? Are, yes. Are we sure that um, kill switch is actually used in the Android model today? Oh, no. I, I, it was on my laptop, just to see so how we'd be laptop. tracing it. Okay. And, and then I was intending to apply it to the touch images, but it didn't work on my laptop first. So. <laughs> um, okay. so, yes, one one of the key questions that I like to get at at least answered in this hangout is uh, I had various conversations uh, around two very different models for um, uh, implementing like power management policies and a bunch of people told me that we need like a central place, a power manager or a power management daemon that would be um, in charge of tracking uh, and enforcing power management policies and other people told me that instead we should be implementing power management in uh, the value stacks and um, I found that it was already quite a, a different way to think about the problem. So I had conversations with Seth and Alex, I think, about like a central power manager. And essentially, I mean, uh, we, we've had this in the past, like uh, uh, things like um, uPower and, and no power manager. And we're kind of the incarnation of power management tracing. And, and they were keeping track of the power management state and were also sometimes enforcing things. Or they would, they would basically, I don't know, fall the Wi-Fi off. Or they would, they would put your system into suspend. Uh, Another related conversation is how do we abstract away some of the power management implementations because we might be using Android kernels and we might be using non-Android kernels. And then I had another completely different conversation with Martin Pitt who was saying, well, maybe we should be doing power management in all of the stacks and, and basically UPower at this point is not doing much anymore, it's just keeping track of statistics and the state of your battery or triggering some low battery event, but that's about it. So, uh, yeah, I want to discuss like the pros and cons of both approaches and, uh, and see whether we really needed to implement any new component or whether we could live with just uPower as a, a place to keep statistics and implement tracing and, and, and trigger like some system-wide events, but generally not implement policy and have policy in all of the stacks, or whether instead we really wanted to have like a central place. Um, I guess I have a question. So, to clarify, I wasn't really saying that we should spread out. Oh, Martin, go oh. ahead, sorry. Okay. Um, I'm a bit lagged here, then hang out. We spread out policy all over the place. I was merely saying that like the functionality of uPower would soon be merged into like GNOME settings daemon. But it's still in one central place which executes like the, the system by policy of the dim the screen and when to auto suspend your machine and so on. So this is a kind of desktop policy which certainly should be in one place. I mean, it's certainly a different question how we treat the default policy, like how can an application stop the automatic suspend, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so, Louis, coming back to your original question, um, I guess from my perspective, um, it feels more doable and more cleanly separated to, to have policy inside the stacks and a central component that offers functionality to execute policies um, as opposed to putting all policies into one central place, which, which would make the, the central place grow like crazy. As with every, every part of middleware we, we add on top, we would need to update the, the central place um, uh, handling the policies. Um, that's that's kind of my gut feeling there. I, I guess um, I would be in favor of having a, 
a set of power management functionality that is available to the uh, to the individual middleware stacks or stacks in general, and those stacks are responsible for executing the power management policies on top of this central set of available um, power management APIs or or services. Does that makes sense. Yeah, kind of. So you're you're advocating for some kind of common abstraction and 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 central decision on policy, but then otherwise all the services providing the various pieces. Yeah. I, yeah, that makes sense to me. So, um, and I don't think we discussed um, a lot with SES that might be a, a topic where SES is like the, the domain expert, is how we uh, do power management with specific like device tags, which might be provided by Android drivers, and uh, that called for some abstraction of uh, how to enter like deep power save modes. So, in particular with, with wake locks and the, the uh, in connection with the Android hardware abstraction uh, daemon, I think you you uh, you explained that you really wanted to, us to reuse this part of the Android stack so that we could really leverage the wake lock features in these drivers and and really put them into the lowest power states. And so it seems to me that we're going to have like different classes of devices, like cases where for the stack we can directly. Uh, manage the, I don't know, like for instance for Wi-Fi devices, we on network management stack is able to put them in the deepest lower state, poor state, but for all your devices we still want to go through the Android Hell, for instance. Yeah, I mean, as far as the wake locks go, what they provide one really useful piece of functionality that I think we can make use of and that's avoiding races with suspending devices and um, receiving wake-up events from the hardware. Um, for general power management, there are some drivers that make use of them. Um, and, you know, today both Android and mainline kernels provide a similar functionality that can take care of this. Um, but, you know, for higher level hardware abstraction things, really the only only really important feature that I see that wake locks provide is avoiding these races. So... But they also provide the ability for an application to say, don't go into a power, you know, don't go into deep sleep. So right. If we decide, one of the decisions we need to make is whether or not we use wake locks at all in user space, right? We could say, no, we don't want to use any of the wake, wake locks in user space, just leverage the kernel driver wake lock mechanisms for firmware loading and driver specific operations. And so if we do that, we just need to replace it with some way so that an application can say, I'm playing music, don't go to sleep automatically. Um, right. Tony, Tony, to so, be honest, I think it's, it's not that binary. It's not only kernel user space, but within user space, I can see. So I would actually vote against exposing wake lock functionality to applications. Um, so C Android, they have, they have yep. a lot of problems with that. Sure. However, Certain middleware that knows what it is doing, um, say, whatever, the sensors, or say, the input stack, um, should be available, uh, or should should be able to leverage wake locks. Because if we have them in the kernel, then uh, leveraging them by system level components, I, I agree with that. Um, so they are kind of in user space, but not exposed to applications. Alex, I guess you have an, uh, uh, an opinion on that as well. Yeah, no, I actually think um, I actually think that's the right way to go, right? So, for instance, um, uh, wake locks are now upstream in the form of suspend, suspend blockers, and that's that's a feature in the upstream kernel, and that's going to be here to stay. Um, it's going to be highly likely that. The hardware, you know, the, the driver vendors, um, the SOC manufacturers, are going to continue using wake locks to implement their power management policies for their actual devices. So I actually don't really have a problem with wake locks, like the abstract idea. The real, the only real problem is exposing it to to user space applications. That's when you get into trouble. So I completely agree with the idea of having privileged middleware or platform, you know. Um, components using the wake locks in a privileged manner to implement whatever policy we, you know, the system implements. Um, the only real mistake is to, to give that raw power to applications. Um, that power should be hidden behind APIs with some guarantees and things like that. Um, but then the idea would be that the application could 
could use the APIs to do whatever. So for instance, like you know, play music in the background, and then the middleware, which is privileged, um, could then step in and do whatever else uh, it, it needed to. That's that's the design that I think makes the most sense. So I'm I'm actually not against wake locks as mechanism, um, and I'm not and uh, I, I think they should be used to implement policy. Um, but I do think the policy needs to be. Um, you know, strictly defined at the application layer, and then implemented by the the middleware or pol or like policy engine. So I think that's what you so described what in your. Uh, go go ahead, Martin. You're you're lagging a bit. Okay, sorry. This is horrible. Yeah. So what is actually wrong with just continuing to using the API instead of using music right now, so that music players can can stop the automatic suspension? And etc. I mean, these have been used that are portable, and uh, so what is wrong with those? So the f the fundamental problem there, if I heard the question correctly, the question to me, so I'm just gonna rephrase to make sure I understood it. But it sounded like, what's the problem with continuing to to give like this sort of like primitive to user space, um, a wake lock primitive or a, a suspend blocker primitive or something like that? And fundamentally, what it boils down to is it it turns your system into the bad old days of cooperative multitasking around power instead of CPU cycles. Um, you know, the fact that you have to go police these applications is is what turns it into, you know, poorly behaved applications. And that's there's been several papers on that. I, I have to dig them out. Um, that says that model just simply doesn't work. I think that's, that's what you call app centric. This is system centric in your in your research, right? Yeah, that's that's just something I invented. Um, but I, I think I think more of the idea is just like it's preemptive versus cooperative multitasking, right? It's like if the system can preempt you in terms of power usage, then the system can optimize for power. Versus if you if you count on the end the end applications to optimize themselves, then that's guaranteed to be suboptimal in terms of power performance. So, so Alex, to be fair, you. Go ahead, Martin. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so, but applications have to be written in a sensible way anyway. I mean, it just do all sorts of crazy things. All sorts of lower, higher level API will burn from that. So, I think in some way, it already has to be cooperative because regardless of whether we use a low level or high level API for applications to do things in the background, they can always be used. Yeah, but uh, like for instance, if you have an API to at the beginning we we're discussing with Thomas having a way for apps to stay running in the background, and we'd say you know you're limited to one percent of the CPU or something, and and that way we don't use all the power. But if instead you have an API to play audio in the background, at least what you can do is say, well, an app is currently playing audio, you can show it in the uh, in the uh, sound indicator, and you can uh, enforce having a single app playing audio in the background. While if you allow like for any app to be in the background, maybe playing audio, then you know you have Different classes of problems. So the fact of having like specialized APIs, um, I think, is a is a good way to protect the system from from abuse in in some way. What what Alex was describing. Now, one one thing which was maybe it is um, how are we going to make sure that we find the right semantics for these APIs? Which which APIs would we need? Because I'm um, at first it seems like you know background audio and and then maybe full screen video and then what happens when you want to just keep the screen on because maybe you're interacting with the user like for instance um, uh, one example that Alex gave me is you have this maps API how do you make sure that the screen stays on uh, with a significantly like a high level API so what's do we want like to try to list like the use cases for uh, giving apps control on uh, power management the limited high level use cases I, do we I think we want to want to call it access to um, to power management, or do we want to do we want applications to be uh, to be able to express to express their requirements in a more declarative way? So apps don't care about power management; they care about being the screen being on, which is which is a subtle difference from my perspective. Yeah, I think that also fits in better with the sort of the uh, declarative nature of Qt QML, um, you know. Declare, declare what you need, and like let the system figure out how to give it to you. Um, you know, to, to Pity's point about like applications will always try to um, abuse APIs. I, I think, I mean, that's true. I agree with you. Um, it's it's going to be a battle, you know, 
for us as system designers versus the application designers or application writers, you know, that's that's just the, the fundamental tension that's always existed. I think it's our role to like provide something that, um, you know, is hard to abuse and makes it easy to get done what you really want to get done. And then, sure, if there's like um, some degenerative cases, we can go either kick them out of the app store or, or, or just say, fine, if you want to do this on your phone, then, then go ahead. But, but I mean, just cause, yeah, just, just right, just because it's hard doesn't mean that we shouldn't try. And then, like, sure, people are going to abuse it anyways, but we should at least try to design something that's sensible, I, I think. I, I certainly agree that we should design this not with malicious applications in mind, because, like, if malicious applications, they can wreck the system in any way. But if you, like, I think in most cases we are concerned with buggy applications which think that they do things the proper way, but they don't. And in this regard, you have, like, if you provide, provide a video playback service, which also has the option of going full screen, that should certainly imply uh, not uh, disabling the screen automatically. I think that's the direction which you want to head in, right? Uh. Maybe I, I heard like eighty percent of what you said. <laughs> so, so you said something about like the video full screen playback and how preventing it to be abused. Could you could you give like an example of that? Like, like maybe an example of the abuse that you would like to protect from. So, like my idea was like in uh, you you proposing that instead of applica giving applications the primitives of uh, inhibiting. And inhibiting screen lock is higher level APIs like video full screen or display an image full screen or like playback music. And these APIs would then define whether or not they would uh, would not block the screen or block suspend, etc. And also take care of reverting that when the video is done, etc. So that you do you have fewer possibilities of interesting applications. So is that what you had in mind, I think? Yeah, I think it is. Um, and, you know, so so let's, yeah, right. So it is it is kind of what I had in mind, at least. And, you know, it does sound like that sort of thought is, is influential here, at least in, at least in this group. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's also kind of an iterative approach, right? You can always give more privileges or define more APIs over time um, as application writers complain and say, hey, you didn't, ne you never gave us a way to do X, Y, Z. Um, in which case, like, fine, we can go ahead and, and define, think that through and, and figure out how that fits into the rest of the system. Um, I, I think, I think, right, like, we, we've done a decent job of identifying the, the most popular probable use cases, background audio, full screen video, I don't know, a couple other things, and like, yeah, say 1.0 October time frame, like this is what we define. And then when people start moaning and hollering, then um, we can go to find more things. Yeah. yeah. So my concern is that the iterative process of finding more things and then blocking and as of implement it will basically be a huge block of writing lots of applications. Like the next time there is an application that comes along which will send you be tracking or needs to be on all the time for another reason but doesn't care about the screen, then we, we have to define more and more high level APIs and what's worse, keep them stable over over time. So I wonder whether it's not better to give a limited set of standard cases like full screen video playback, but still expose the lower level inhibited API to applications as well so that from doing more specific things where we do not want to offer APIs. But once you give that, once you have that like um, thing defined or given to them, that privilege, the, that lower level privilege given to them, you can never take that back, like ever, right? I mean, that, that fits in exactly your point about keeping the, the API stable. So, I mean, it's a good point, right? Like, how does if you're if you're concerned about how do we scale application growth and does that block on the system design um, you know I think I think what will actually end up happening is that people will be creative and they will go abuse APIs and like so for instance I can imagine I don't know I'm I'm a game writer and I forgot you know the platform doesn't give me a way to keep uh, the screen on all the time because we didn't provide just a, a generic system screen wake lock 
well, maybe what I'll do is I'll just play a silent wave file in the background all the time and like keep the screen on that way. Um, I mean, I think I think AppWriter is going to be pretty creative. There's lots and lots of um, workarounds people can do, and um, you know, and then it's kind of our job is like, well, I, I don't really think that I don't really think that we'll be blocking app writers. I, f I feel app writers are, are pretty creative people. They're used to dealing with black boxes, anyways. And if our system's open, they can go figure out like what they need to do to get their to get their application to work. I, I'm I'm a little bit less concerned about that rather than like at least trying to to get in the right direction. I don't know. I think um, um, Martin, um, I I tend to agree with Alex. The one thing that concerns me, for example. When looking at Android, they gave out the wake-up primitives or ways of, of uh, for an application to to work in terms of, of lower-level primitives. And so, the battery life in Android is depending on the applications you have installed is is uh, yeah not that great, let's say. And then um, people. Uh, people come up with apps to selectively kill your background apps, and they actually analyze the lower-level primitive situation on weight locks um, to do so. And um, I think we all agree that we should avoid this situation. Um, can you? What's your mind on that? So I, I'm thinking about this Qualcomm app that basically um, sits in the background um, and and observes your system and makes sure that no no power Drainers stay online for too long, or stay stay started and running for too long. Right. So I mean, I think that's an extreme case when you you you've, all the walls have been broken already, and apps are in the wild, and they are doing the wrong thing, and they are polluting your system, and that's that's a, the, the patch on top of it to try to avoid like the system actually. Yeah, sure. But to um, battery. but uh, what what other intermediate steps we can take is of course we can have like the infrastructure to track power consumption from apps. Um, so that the user can see which apps are using power, and we can also uh, proactively remove apps from uh, distribution channels if we see that they are wasting too much power or give them negative ratings. But again, they are a bit too defensive. So ideally, we would adjust over time and make sure that our APIs and implementation avoid that. So I don't know whether it would be okay like to co collect data from uh, uh, running apps and and trying to I don't know anonymize it or something and see. Uh, you know which apps are the worst uh, uh, power sucking, and um, and and use that uh, to to feed into the app store or something where you'd be or not the app store but the the app um, software center or whatever ratings from forties of that app, trying to say you know there is a bad power management uh, characteristics to that app. Uh, that there might be a way to try to have a, have a feedback loop on the existing apps available to users. Yeah, I like that idea a lot because, and I think eventually we are going to need it anyway because applications can can do bad power or like can have a bad behavior with regard to power usage in a lot of other ways than just keeping a screen turned on. Like they can do computations all the time or use the network all the time, and we can hardly prevent them from from doing all that. So like the the review the power applications and making them Available somehow sounds like a great idea to me. I, I've got a question. Should a user care? Use what? Sorry. Should a user care well, about that? If you care about battery life, you certainly will. And who doesn't? I think um, I'm. I I have a slightly different opinion there. I think um, the platform should make should try to make sure that. Um, battery is like the, the or power in general is the sacrificed resource. Oh no, is the is the sacred resource here, and um, should protect it with all means. That's that's what I'm thinking. Yeah, that's right. But I mean, you you, you can't forbid applications to. Like, I mean, you can certainly cut the CPU away of an from an application after like two seconds, but then you also cut out legitimate. App you can actually do have to do this amount of computation. So that's a bit hard to see in advance. And for some applications, two seconds of CPU power is way too much, and for some it's way too little. So how do we Yeah, in the end you cannot control everything. I do agree. How do we specify? So like could we define this as a privilege? Like Yeah. 
also think that the system should be doing the right thing by default, but eventually we'll, we'll need a way to uh, improve it over time. So what, one of the discussions I had with Thomas this morning was basically that um, we felt it was more important to get the system right in the beginning if, and if it was offering too little APIs at, at first, and apps would be maybe prevented from doing pot potentially interesting things, but that would be sucking power. Um, and then over time, we would open it up so that you can do more and more things. But um, I, like, I don't know, like, like background updates or notifications or, you know, keeping the screen on or uh, reacting to key presses or whatever. There might be these things which are uh, bad in terms of power consumption that we cannot offer in first versions of um, um, Ubuntu Touch, but which over time we can, we can offer if we identify um, the right classes of use cases. I think I think the one thing that we're we're not talking about yet, and I'm just bringing this up because like um, it's it's important to mention um, the one elephant in the room that we're not talking about is that the models that are system centric um, have a more tightly regulated app store, right? The Apple App Store policy is infamous, and I'm fairly certain Windows App Store is. is Similarly restrictive, um, the app, and the Android app store is kind of like the Wild West. Um, I think these things go hand in hand, and I don't know what our, I don't know what our future looks like in terms of of what the app store policies or restrictions or whatever will do. I think I would prefer something more permissive rather than restrictive, um, and maybe we can be clever with some of our our tools like App Armor or something like that. Um, but you know that I I do want to say like that makes their pro the, that that restriction on the App Store makes the problem more tractable for the other OSs. Um, you know, it's something we have to think about and think through. Um, I'm actually not putting forward any opinion as to which one we should go for, but I'm just saying, like, that is that is important. So, like, you know, if you're thinking to yourself, oh, my God, this is a huge problem and we'll never solve it, just know that there are some, like, sort of um, other techniques outside of the platform itself, or if you consider the platform as more than just, like, the bits in the phone, but um, the sort of human policy around... Uh, uh, your platform, um, so that that's why I bring this up. Hey, Alex, w one point on that though. I mean, a Apple reviews applications not just for power management. I mean, there are many things that they review. Right. So you know, it's not all or nothing if we don't do that. Uh, yeah, yeah, I understand. But just you know, like the, it helps them, and that's another tool they have in their tool belt. It does. Yeah. And this is also why I think that like, the power usage profile of an application and making that public somehow will be helpful, not necessarily to end users who install the application, but perhaps to the reviewers of like our sub percent or wherever we, we put those applications. Because like as a human reviewer, you certainly see like this shouldn't take much power or like a like a scientific application certainly could. So okay. I don't know. It sounds to me that we kind of have like broad agreement at least about the sort of the the shape, the direction. Um, what's the most productive use of our time for the rest of it? Because I feel like we've we've actually kind of yeah. <laughs> so we've what, gone over the app centric versus system centric thing like thousands of times. It feels like, or maybe at least I have. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a good point. So the the maybe one thing we can try doing is trying to identify like the top um, APIs that we might be currently missing for. Um, that, that kind of impact for management and where we might want to offer some kind of alternative. So one thing which I think we've identified as not being implemented at all right now is the whole concept of a notification service, a notification server. So that's um, something Thomas and I have been discussing, but it's, um, yeah, that's why it's still remote and, and, and still completely draft and remote, but um, eventually it might make sense. Um, another one is this background audio playback kind of API. Uh, that seems to be like everybody seems to be in agreement. We want something like that. Uh, I now I don't know about others. Like I, I, I propose like full screen video playback, but I, I don't think that's very trivial to define. Um, while background audio playback seems at least vaguely um, uh, definable, the full screen video playback is just an idea was trying to keep the screen on when you're playing a video, but it's not a great use case. Typically, the media player would call into something. Uh, I, so I, I don't know whether we want to provide like a completely disabled screen turn off. Um, API um, and make sure that it's not abused, or whether we we can find like better APIs to express that. So 
so I don't know whether uh, anyone here, so maybe maybe Alex or Matt had researched like typical APIs that were put in place by more system-centric uh, approaches like iOS. Uh, that would be really important yeah, to get right. Another one that um, is nice to have is like a background location update. So you can basically register and say when the location changes more than, I don't, there, I, I think, I think iOS has like a, a fine grained and a coarse grained. When you get a, a, a big location change, it'll sort of wake your app up and let it run for a little bit. Um, that's another API that I know. People so we did use. we did consider having that as part of the location APIs, but we didn't actually do it in the background. So that's a good one because we only, so far we only like. I mean, your app is running and you're requesting location updates and you get notified, but we didn't. We don't sort of the case like I'm registering a. Uh, please notify me if my location changes or something kind of API, and that might make sense. We actually uh, updated that. We, we updated that since? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I have a question totally about well. I have a question about the full screen video playback. Uh, you have full screen video playback, but you might also have uh, you might there there could be other use cases where you'd want the screen to stay on. Yeah. Is, there, is there a reason not to just provide a screen stay on API? With the caveat being that you can't do it if you're if you're a background app, it has to, you have to be the foreground app. Is there a reason why we don't want to do that? No, well, I think this was exactly the question I was asking earlier. Like, we should we like provide like a more generic API for things like the maps uh, use case or all the I'm displaying something that needs to be on all the time use case. Maps or I I have like a, a app app I use at the gym that that stays on that you know that I like to. Eat. Keep on while I'm at the gym. So, um, what we what we could leverage here is that we um, we have a full screen mode essentially, and we call it a full screen session. So, um, considering the an application lifetime or lifeline, um, it roughly looks like this. So, imagine imagine a game. I'm taking a game as an example. Mm -hmm. You start up the game and you get an option screen. That's not full screen. It's like you have shell elements visible, like like the menu bar. Um, and stuff like that. Um, and then you start the game, and the app basically uh, starts a so-called full screen session, which indicates to the system, hey, I, don't, I, I would like to leverage as much as possible of the available screen real estate. So the shell transitions away, the menu bar, and so on and so forth. And um, the app already expresses an interest in being in having exclusive access to to the screen real estate. So we can just leverage this signal. Um, so whenever an application says, hey, I want to be full full, full screen, let's say, um, and starts this full screen session, we basically say, um, cool, um, we keep the screen on. We, we just interpret the intention of the app with respect to the screen. Um, but um, from a system perspective, we reserve the right to end the full screen session at our own discretion if certain events come in. Does that make sense? Um, it would be quite declarative, um, and we can, we can leverage um, a very, very high-level signal. Sorry, Tony, for interrupting you. No, no, I was just going to say, how would you tell the difference between um, a movie playback or a game that's full screen and just an image where you might want the screen to blank? Would the application actually declare when it went full screen that it also wanted to stay on? I think um, uh, I, so, uh, Matt, go ahead. Sorry, I, I think it should. I think there's a difference between being full screen and wanting the screen to stay on. Go ahead, Tom. I I cannot see the difference, to be honest. Well, I mean, if you you're playing a movie, right? You don't want the thing to blank. But if you just showed someone a picture full screen and put your phone down, you're not paying attention to it. You probably want it to turn off. So okay, so what you're saying, um, so like like keep screen on should be should be an indication by the application to the system. Yes, and yes. I think you mentioned earlier the the possibility of an application giving hints on what it would like to do for certain APIs. So you may be using an API that's going to inhibit the system from suspending, um, but it might not be important to you. But this is yeah, I think close to the low-level inhibit API that we just discarded, isn't it? It does sound a little bit like that, but I mean, I, I guess you know. Otherwise, how would you tell the difference, right? If you all, if your semantics were an application asks for full screen surface, 
right? Then you're never going to turn the screen off. That works in some cases, but in other cases, it doesn't make sense. Yeah, this is yeah, point I mean, why we should also offer the lower level API because we are never going to cover all the use cases with the high level APIs. Or we have to have two different use cases, so like a, an API to do full screen with screen block and full screen without screen. Yeah, I, I can think of uh, uh, contradictory use cases to the ones we covered earlier. Like, for instance, you're in a full screen game, but you're in pose, or you're in the options. Then it's okay to turn off the screen, or you're in a, a you're in a, a, doing a diaporama, but you you don't want to take like the full screen. You just uh, just want to show them like within the other controls available, or you are in a maps API and and uh, sorry in a, in a maps uh, navigation app and you want to you want to show the map but you you, st you don't want like to take the whole screen because you still want the other controls like on a Wi-Fi or network or whatever or incoming messages to be visible so you're not like taking you're maximized maybe but you're not like you're not like full screen and so um, I'm sure it would be okay to force apps to be full screen to keep to be able to keep the screen on but foreground seems like a good a good semantic. Yeah, I was just um, looking to see. It's always it's always interesting to see what iOS, <clears throat> excuse me, to see what iOS does, and they provide an API to disable. Yeah, it's a screen wake lock. If you think of it, they it's they call it disable the idle timer, um, but they do give applications a very generic way to do this. They do have a generic way to do it. Yeah, yeah. I just pasted a link into the Etherpad. Yeah, um, I think almost everybody does because this is it's a very common use case. You're watching a video. You want you don't want the screen to turn off. You're playing a game. You don't want the screen to turn off. I mean, is the bigger danger from wake locks this thing where it allows the screen to go off, but it doesn't allow the CPU to suspend? So it's draining power, but it's unbeknownst to you because the device looks like it's really suspended. I mean, is that really the wake lock use case that we need to prevent? And the yeah. keep the screen on use case is okay. That's yeah, a really I think that's a good one. Yeah, yeah. We could we could enforce like that whenever the screen is turned off, an application is actually put to sleep. That the application goes in the background. I mean, it's not in the foreground anymore. It's not active anymore. So it get gets suspended, just like we suspend apps which you you're not showing in the foreground. Yeah, I think like I said, I, I think Matt like Matt said, um, every every other OS does this. Um, and that that also appeals to Pity's point. Like we're not going to be able to guess every situation where an application <laughs> needs to keep a screen on. I, I would provisionally accept this one and just say, yeah, like why not? Um, and maybe like maybe we'll go take an action. You can give it to either Matt or myself. We can go off and look and just just double check and see if anyone's like um, did this, but they didn't really want to, or if this is like a piece of legacy in iOS. Um, so so you can give us an action to go do some due diligence. Um, but but I think in general this one's probably not so bad. And I guess regardless of how high or low level the APIs are, we should make sure that we. So we can detect the uh, we can automatically determine the set of uh, like the set of potentially power uh, relevant facts about an application without having to read the entire source code. I mean, Alex, you know, to one point, though, I mean, if we give this inhibit, in some sense, it is like a wake lock, and then we'd have to reference count this in user space, and when it gets to zero, then we allow the screen to blank, and eventually the system goes to sleep. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Um, um, oh. But I do think that kind of like what Seth said had it made sense, too, right? It's like, if I'm a user, and I'm looking at my phone, and, like, some application is grabbed this keep screen on thing, but then I press like my hard power button on the side or wherever the power button is, that can override that wake lock. Um, and we whatever. don't really need to reference count, right? Because only the foreground app should be allowed to do this. Yeah. We just need to keep it as part of the app state so that when it comes back in the foreground, after being in the background, it keeps the screen on again. Alex, actually, the, the power button and there are two different levels of wake locks in Android. So there's one that actually the power button won't override. Well, but I think that's what Seth was talking about, was that like the application could have grabbed the CPU lock and and that's a, a case of like, you know, the, the application grabbed a, a CPU wake lock but didn't grab the screen wake lock. 
and that's like a case where it's it's not very obvious to the user that the the thing is still draining your battery. Um, right, exactly, and that that's right. what like the music playback is going to do. It's going to grab. It's called a partial user space wake lock. And right. The, part, the power button won't override it. Right. So so again, I think it's important that we separate in our minds that like it's not that wake locks are bad. It's how they get presented to the user and in what form. Right. So if it gets if it gets presented to the user in terms of like a music background playing API, then that's that's probably okay. But if it just says like, oh well, here's a partial CPU wake lock, you know, and you would use this Whatever to like build it. Yeah, that that's not that's not okay. I, um, I mean, your point is taken, right? I, I I get it. That's not just I don't know. I mean, like your point of 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 um the screen primitive as being like you know some degenerate form of, of wake locks. Like I I hear you, but I don't know. Like I said, it it, it seems like everyone's doing it. So <laughs> we don't seem to have an alternative, really. I mean, we couldn't find really a way to track all the possible things. So we could try to research one with it. We we took an action to go chase it down and make sure that like this is hard to abuse or like maybe there's just no possible way around it. So we'll we'll run this one to ground, this particular one. Yeah, I mean as I understand it, like Android's use of wake locks kind of grew over time. We might find that we need more than just a generic wake lock at some point. But if we say, look, we're gonna that, this is the minimum we're gonna do right now, um, it's a good starting point. So I, um, one, I didn't really know whether we wanted to include or not is the um, a, a background like download service because um, I, I, I wonder whether it should be like handled with notifications or something like that, which others might be doing with their cloud services like on, on iCloud or you know Google Drive or something. Uh, should we do, we do want something like to like for a podcasting app to be able to download a podcast in the background? Is this something that we should try to have in terms of? Uh, uh, Power saving API so that the system is aware that the download is happening and then turns off the Wi Fi. But the app is not like foreground. Or, Matt, you seem to have like another list of background services well, that we should be offering. That's a good case. I guess I, I thought um, some of the mobile OSs had their own download manager that handled those for you, but that if we're not going to do that, then that's a good use case. Um, there was two more um, that I knew about one is push notifications. Um, I think that's how something like, um, what's that chat? There's something called WhatsApp. I guess like a, it's like a chat client you can use to get, yeah. but doesn't use SMS. So that, yeah. that has to basically be like an SMS where you don't have to be using your SMS app to get an SMS. And then the other one is um, for background calls. It doesn't even have to be a phone call. It could be Skype. Um, uh, yeah, so that, that's from the notification API and notification server, which is um, a topic we explored um, quite a bit with Thomas, but we, we don't have anything for that right now. And, and um, there are quite interesting papers on how it's achieved on, uh, uh, on, on iOS and, and um, on, on Windows 8. And uh, it's, um, Android also has one, but it's not used by apps that much. But basically, it forces you. If you ever want to, get a, to deliver a message to a um, system, an iOS device, for instance, which is off, which is screen off, you would um, you would use this notification API, and it allows like for a bunch of power management optimizations. For instance, you're you're only pushing notifications if they are high priority enough. You're not pushing them like all the time. Like all the lo low notifications can be aggregated on the server side and pushed at once. And you can also decide in notification message itself whether uh, the application should be waken up or not. So, for instance, say you're seeing a, a, a Skype call, uh, your I don't know. Phone or your tablet might show you you're sending an, a Skype call. Do you want to pick it up? But if you decide not to pick it up, the Skype app was not even launched. It just remained like a notification on the on the at the operating system level, so that it's not you know you're not launching an app just for that. And so yeah, it, it allows for lots of optimizations, but it also it's also a lot of work, and we we don't have that yet. So for instance, it requires like. Um, um, Managing like certificates, connections to the notification server, notification server itself. You need a protocol so that external yeah. services like say, well, Skype, for instance, would connect to you, notify you about things going on. Like there is incoming call, the Skype server needs to notify you about that. So it's a um, it's a big project. Uh, does it does it require us to maintain a cloud service to handle all the notifications? I yes. Yeah, that's what. you need one. Uh, you need some kind of notification. So yeah, I know. I know for Windows 8, Microsoft put a lot of work into really pushing people to use that. And the, the, and they, it's really something that, 
each, each operator also wants to run a copy of it so that they, they are not dependent on, on you or something, or that when yours goes down and the, the, the customer still receives notification or something. So there are many, many complex use cases around that. So, yeah. So I don't think we've scratched the surface of that one. No, we haven't. So, uh, Matt and Louis, uh, I guess I have a question. So we have identified um, a few background use cases, like downloading whatever, a file, um, playing music, um, perhaps something like as simple as watching a socket or whatever. Um, would it make sense to collect those things and then have something like a background task service? Uh, where, where an application developer can say, hey, system, um, I have a task here, which is of a, out of a set of predefined possible background tasks that we allow per, per API version. And um, please take care of it. And either the app stays in foreground and stays alive, and um, the test completes while, while the app is, is, is running. Um, and then the app can handle it, <clears throat> or the app goes to the background and uh, it is it's killed or whatever in our life cycle story. And the next time it comes up again, it's notified that an outstanding operation um, has, been, has been completed while it, was, while it was sleeping or while it was not, not running. Um, and then it can handle the, the data transparently. Would that make sense? Um, does the operation have to run in terms Terminate, or can it continue to run, Thomas? I think, Tony, uh, that's a problem. I'm, I'm not talking about um, arbitrary tasks. I'm, I'm talking about a, a set of tasks that, that are predefined in version 1, like okay. download a file, yeah, play, yeah, that, right. play, play a playlist, whatever. Um, and right. then over time, this would, be, this would be a way to open up the system as well, right, selectively, where we say, hey, you can, you can have a... a uh, you can enqueue a task for execution that at, uh, and the um, the application has to has to say uh, this uh, this task will take at most five seconds and after that um, it's even killed in the background so this this could be a way to do it um, I, I guess um, we just need a central way um, for handling background tasks and not like a download service and a music player service um, should be exposed directly. Um, uh, but more like uh, have a central point of entry that then dispatches to the respective other system components or middleware components that take care of it. I think that's what Windows 8 does. Um, I'm not sure about iOS, but I, I think in iOS you register a background task as well. Okay. Look, I'm just... Oops. So I guess you're like time bounded, like you have like three seconds to execute and then that's it or something. Yeah, for arbitrary tasks, but then there are predefined tasks or predefined types of tasks. Um, um, like a download. That's That shouldn't be time bounded. Okay, so uh, we have something like a bit more than five minutes left and there were some questions on IRC and on winterwarner.com, so... One of them is, um, as a goal is to reach converge, so it's a question from Mohamed, um, and the question is, as a goal is to reach convergence between the desktop and phone code base, will the poor management rules also apply for desktop apps like video renderers? So Martin, you want to um, start answering this one? Um, yeah, so I, uh, my understanding is that this only applies to like newly written applications, use phone, tablet, Ubuntu SDK. I mean, we can hardly change all like 30,000 packages. And there is also like there's such a diversity in those packages that we can hardly categorize them into this kind of app model that we try to build here. Or did I misunderstand that? Oh, yeah, I think that's fair, but we, we, might, we might be able to um, box them or something, know that one of these old world applications is running, and so we. Um, take a specific power management profile for this classification as long as it's running. So I don't know if you're running. It's it's just like running a, a Mir app on your sorry an X app on your Mir system, where you might be running uh, an adaptation layer like an, an X Mir or something to to show the 
the, the X app on your MIS system. So similarly, if you're running an app that requires um, using an old Sun API or something, or uh, that uses um, Tizzle that, yeah, and also an API might be a good example. So we just bridge the sound to the new audio layer, and as long as it's running, and then we'd kill the adaptation layer. So you could, I mean, if if impact. the system, and the other the other possibility is that as the system, you know, as the system code bases converge um, in the plumbing layer, the system can still detect whether it's running on a desktop or, or a phone. Um, even if you're in converge mode, you should still be able to figure out you're on a phone, and say like, yeah, in in desktop mode, like all my policy turns into no ops, or at least you know some other policy gets implemented, um, where the apps don't really you know with it's less um, less restrictive for the desktop. Right, but I'm, what I'm saying is that we yeah. can't just take away like inhibitor APIs or direct harbor access or like anything else that we currently have on the desktop. Like we, we can't take that away. We just cannot. Ex we, we can just not expose it to the Ubuntu SDK. But certainly, all the existing software that we have in Ubuntu will still continue to use it. Yeah, that's a good point. I. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a problem that's really hard. Um. <laughs> I mean, if, if if you're on a converged device, can't you? Do Detect whether you're running in a desktop mode or a phone mode, and only allow the desktop apps to be running while you're in the desktop mode. Well, certainly. I mean, this would like, if you install like MySQL or Apache or whatever, and then you might that, uh, want to run that on phone mode, like an application that you might have on your desktop. Well, one of the other points is you're going to want to have the same components. I mean, this whole idea is converging, right? So we'd like to converge on a, on a middleware stack we can use for power management that works in both cases. I, I think the idea of a converged yeah, device... Yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Pity. Well, I mean, the stack should signify it, like, in the sense of what's the, the policy in you know, the desktop using new disks and new power or login and whatnot, but I mean, in terms of the API applications, uh, that'll certainly not converge anytime soon. Like the, the, the APIs for doing video playback and whatnot that we are about to create. I, I think the converge devices, it's, it's really hard. Um, you know, so right now, the current Ubuntu for Android product that uh, that my team's working on, you know, we're not even trying to address this. We are just treating this as an embedded Ubuntu, full Ubuntu desktop um, in its own separate sandbox, you know, on an Android phone. And we don't implement, we don't do anything fancy or, or tricky with power. Um, we kind of get away from with this because it's, it's the case where you have to keep your phone plugged in to use the UFA desktop. Um, and also, we're not going to go and rewrite and you know thousands of applications or even any applications really to to work better on the phone. Um, I at this point I don't really know what that future looks like. I think it's a hard problem. We just that's that's a couple a couple steps out. Um, <laughs> I don't really know. I mean I think it's it's hard and I acknowledge it. I just don't really have an answer right now. It's two release cycles, the old six month cycles. So. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> so keep the, moving with the questions. <laughs> yeah, so what, Easier what I would mention as well is an, another way to, to, to tackle this problem is also to give um, end users the possibility of disabling some of these uh, power management characteristics. So that, for instance, if, you're, if your device automatically goes to sleep when in idle and we cannot detect that, you want to keep like some process running like MySQL or uh, PostgreSQL or whatever, then, or Apache, then we provide a mean for you to disable like uh, going into sleep automatically, but the screen might still be going into power of while the CPU is still on. So that might be something that, especially end user policy, manual policy for advanced use cases, where people will be able to poke at policy files or something, but that's, yeah, it's for advanced use cases only, right? You, it, it, It's a use case for a developer workstation or something like that, but not, it, it's not a use case for, I guess, general purpose computer or tablet or phone. I think um, um, 
Luke is right here. We, <clears throat> for the phone use case, for the mobile use case, we need infrastructure in place that applications that are meant to be run on the phone can talk to and um, interact with, uh, with the system in terms of power management stuff. Very high level, very broad. Um, however, um, we implement the policy and we can make it configurable. And if we, uh, for, for a workstation setup, you can just completely disable the policy. That's, that's my thinking behind the scenes. So, uh, so we're almost at the end of the time. So I, th there is a, a blueprint, a meta blueprint, tracking a bunch of blueprints related to mobile power management uh, that is in, this, in the Etherpad. So you can subscribe to the sub blueprints if you're interested in, in getting updates about the work and uh, contact like the relevant um, assignee of each blueprint if you want to get involved. Uh, we are likely going to sing again on that at the Viral UDS um, in, what is it, in May. Yeah, um, but um, I'm, clearly there are, there are some more research that is going on. I mean, um, we, we, we want to search the state of the Ubuntu Touch images. Uh, we want to start impl some implementation and we'll have more information about some of these problems. Um, like, for instance, the notifications uh, also need to be specified. So there are many, many things that we will be working on in the next month. It's, it's not it's far from being completely specified, but it seems we have some of the key bases agreed upon that we need to provide some kind of minimal wake lock implementation f to keep the screen turn on, but otherwise we're going to be like mostly system centric. Um, we want to keep st things turned off all the time whenever possible. We want to have a good policy on the uh, distribution channel so that we can call out for uh, apps when they are using lots of power. I, yeah, I think these are the key things that I'm, I'm, I'm taking from this call. Any any other comments from anyone before we wrap this up? Cool. It's, thanks a lot, Daniel, for running the Hangout. Yeah, I, I didn't have to do much. Uh, do, are you going to, to send those notes to uh, the development mailing list? Sure. Perfect. Excellent. Maybe the Ubuntu phone list. Oh, yeah, that sounds good. <clears throat> All right. Thanks a lot, everyone. And have a great day. <laughs> thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks, Daniel. Bye-bye. Thanks, Thanks, everyone.